Today's episode of Mark Who 42's Hooniverse is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash markhu42. There are over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, you lucky guys. That's www.audibletrial.com slash markhu42. Hi, this is Dominic Glynn. I'm a TV and film composer, a composer for Doctor Who in the 1980s. Um, you're listening to Mark Who 42's Hooniverse. Mark Who 42's Hooniverse. Hey, groovy fans, all you Whovians out there, this is DJ Christian Basil. You're listening to Mark Who 42's Hooniverse. And with me today, as always, are... Patricia Helm. <laughs> Hey, who is this young whippersnapper with the with the weird with the weird sort of loco grassy stuff? Hey, somebody call the cops! Just kidding, it's Eduardo and Fryer. And today we also got on our show. Hey everybody, Patty Hawkins with uh, Come Get Some. Uh, once again, able to bask in the glory that is Marco Forty Two in the comfort of my underwear in my own home. We did not need to know that. Okay. Groovy, yes, back did. in his underwear. We like this knowledge. Thank you very. I'm going to stop this. This is really ridiculous. Hey everyone, welcome <laughs> gonna, to Marco Forty Two Universe. To, uh, come to your house, Christian. Take away your copy, uh, Revelation of the Daleks. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to take that. Oh, a freaky DJ. I still have nightmares about that guy. Anyway, well, <laughs> that's right. I'm the boss with the hot sauce. Spitting all the platters with less <laughs> Anyway, folks, welcome to Mark Who's 42 Hooniverse, Doctor Who Hooniverse, that is. And speaking of really groovy stuff, let's go to... Speaking of really groovy stuff, let's go to Doctor Who News with our groovy Doctor Who correspondent, Patricia Helm. Patricia, what groovy Doctor Who News do we have on this groovy day? I'm going to stop saying groovy. <laughs> groovy, groovy, groovy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, guess what finally came out this week? The final ratings for last Christmas, just, you know, almost two months later. <laughs> so the final number was 8.28 million viewers. Of course, this is all UK ratings. but um, So if you go in ranking all of the episodes from last season, last Christmas came in just behind Deep Breath. Deep Breath still had the highest ratings of any of the episodes from last season. Well, I think that's, I think that's actually kind of impressive that uh, it, it, it bookended just about Evenly, if you think about it, um, there's not a lot of uh, seemingly viewer degradation between that and Christmas. Granted, the Christmas episode, you know, is kind of a you have a captive audience or at night where everybody's hung the presents and the Christmas stuff and had their Christmas goose or whatever it is they eat over in the UK. But that's that's promising. I think that's promising for the show in the whole. I was reading all these articles and I know it was from the, the mirror and all these guys that were saying, well, the ratings are dropping, the ratings are dropping. And then I was looking on other Whovian sites and blogs and uh, not naming any names, but somebody actually come out there. I can't stand it that the ratings are going down. The ratings going down. And I actually went on Wikipedia and looked at the ratings. And I said the ratings for Matt Smith's last series and the one for Capaldi series were practically almost dead even. So I didn't, I was like, well, where are the bad ratings go to? Because with the exception of the day of the time of, and the name of, where the ratings peaked up a little bit because of more of an interest there and the, there was more stuff going on or that the ratings for Capaldi in the last season of Matt Smith were practically almost dead even. So I don't well, know remember, it, it is not, not, not to dismiss you or anything, but it is Wikipedia. And you got to take Wikipedia with a grain of salt the size of the brain of Morbius. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think probably maybe a lot of the attractors, you know, might just be the Capaldi, not haters per se, but uh, maybe the Capaldi detractors uh, who are just trying to jump on anything they can to just get them out the door. Or just not happy with the direction the show is going. Um, I mean, there's going to be yeah, there's going to be an ebb and a flow, and and of course, none of these numbers reflects the international numbers, which I'm not privy to. But I think some of you guys have, have pulled them out. And I think globally, the show is, uh, is is still rocking pretty hard, unless I'm grossly mistaken. No, oh, from what I understand, if and correct me if I'm wrong, BBC America, the highest ratings have been Capaldi's thus far and i believe it, from other news articles i've read i think what was it space tv in canada or something like that the ratings have 
either gone up or they're still holding their ground. So as far as an oh, yeah, I keep forgetting about cool. Canada. <laughs> really? <laughs> they're kind of easy to forget. Oh, no. Oh, no. love our Canadian no, that's, fans. That's, please. That's, no, that's not an insult. That just, that's just like, you know, I mean, they just – they seem, from our perspective, they always just seem to leave a quiet life, and who wouldn't want to lead a quiet okay. life? You know? <laughs> so what we're saying is, charge it to our heads, but not our hearts. That's that's what we're saying with that one. Yes. Forget we love Canada. Canada. No, we Forget love Canada. Canada. My, my grandfather's from Canada, so yeah, I love Canada. <laughs> let's, let's not forget. Let's not forget William Shatner is Canadian, so. <laughs> Yeah, but as, we'll, we'll as well as a lot of the a lot of the best talent from SCTV in their glory days. So yeah. There you go. Next on the news, uh, this is kind of a spoiler, so maybe you know, turn on the spoiler. Oh God, alert. where is that? Where oh, is I that? It. I got it. I got it. Oh, you got? It. Oh God! I got. Oh wait, you want it louder? Okay, let me go. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. There he goes. Is that loud enough for no, my Christian? No. Oh, wait, you want it louder? No. <laughs> sorry, I can't hear you, but the. Oh. So last week, they started filming Block 2 of Series 9, and uh, Block 2 is going to be directed by Hetty McDonald. We talked about her last week. She was the lady that directed Blink back in 2007. And BBC, they kind of teased us, and they released a picture of a world map that had all these red dots all over it. It looks like it's inside a unit headquarters. And so they're saying that Gemma Redgrave is going to be coming back as Kate Stewart. Woo! Nice. Now bring back Osgood. Yeah. <laughs> Give up Moffat well, and just make it the which, Saigon that got killed. Please, please Give up come now. On, yeah, come on. If they, if they bring back Osgood, there is no way, no way that she won't be the Zygon. You know, <laughs> from an entertainment, it, from a narrative utility purpose, is let's see, we can bring back the human one, or we can bring back the shapeshifter sucker one who thinks she's human. I thought, hmm. I thought the Zygons can't keep the human form unless the human person's alive. It's true. Uh, 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 oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe so see, then, maybe she's more, not dead. Yeah, well, see, there you go. See, it's, it's I, I kind of feel like Moffat insisting that it was the real Osgood that died, not the Zygon, is like when DC Comics took 10 years to bring Hal Jordan back. It's like, nope, nope, he's dead. Nope, never coming back, never coming back. Nope, nope, never coming back. I think we can all believe that, that Moffat... If anything, he is an opportunist, and he will take the mystery of is she or isn't she, and he will probably make that a thing throughout the rest of Capaldi's run, at least, <laughs> or at least spin it, or at least resolve it to the point where it's ready to go into the, the proposed uh, unit uh, spinoff. So she's going to be in Tahiti, maybe. I know you really, really want to connect <laughs> Doctor Who to the Marvel Universe, but not that way. Hey, they've already connected. They've already connected. It's already happened. I, I, I've, I've had nothing to do with it. Well, speaking of Kate Stewart, there is going to be some Big Finish unit stories coming out. Really? I saw that. that. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. The first one's going to be called Unit Extinction. And so far, the only cast members they have announced is Kate Stewart. And the first one will be uh, released in November of this year, and you're going to be able to pre-order it pretty soon. And when you pre-order it, you're going to get a copy of Nicholas Courtney's memoirs, A Soldier in Time, as a free download. Oh. Oh. And then they're going to release three more box sets that will be um, separated. It'll be six months apart and all four will be available as a bundle for pre-order pretty cool i wonder if maybe what patrick says maybe they will spin off unit into a series like actual television show you know one of the great things about big finish is we could have osgood back it could just be set before deep breath that is true so i'd love to see units kind of pick up the pieces of torchwood um mm. I imagine they probably want to keep them separate but equal, but uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be very interested to see Unit be all. <laughs> At least have a great scene with Captain Jack where she's like, okay, you tried and you made a mess of this. Now let's leave it to the professionals, Mr. Immortal Man. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, who wouldn't want to see Captain Jack try to try to get all over her like he does with everybody? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I could see I, – I don't know. I could see Kate Stewart seems like the type that would just, you know, tell uh... – you know, just look at Captain Jack and just be like, put the gun back in the holster, Captain. You just kind of shoot him down. And the, and then probably when she says Captain, say it like with air quotes. <laughs> <laughs> I know Kate has gotten really aggressive. Her character has gotten really aggressive since uh, 
Death in Heaven where she threw the Cyberman head on the ground. So you left this behind on your last incursion. <laughs> so well, I was know, like, I mean, wow. hey, she, you know, Kate, uh, I don't know, you know, look, look at who Kate's dad is. I mean, you know, she's it's true. She's learned she's learned from the best, you know. She she won't take it from anybody. You know, I mean, I'm sure if a Centauran was there like, you know, you'll surrender now or we will disintegrate you. She'll probably just look at him and just be like, "Are you done? Are you finished?" You know? Oh, Captain Jack showed up. She's gonna go like she's gonna grab the face of Bo and go. You left this in traffic somewhere. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> just like really, you want to screw with me? Yeah. I'm no, good. She'll, I'm a well, she'll probably she'll player. probably say something like she'll probably say something like, "I see you don't age well, Captain Harkness. You, you may want some moisturizer." Do you think if Osgood ever met Captain Jack, she would add something of his to her outfit? How she's, you know, has all the different doctor parts. She would. She would actually, I think she'd have, like, the, uh, not the chronometer thing that he wears, but she'd probably have a big bulky watch thing. She'd start sporting that. <laughs> if he didn't outright just give it to her as a, uh, at the end of the adventure, you know, give her, like, a nice little pat on her head sort of kiss. And like, Here you go. Something to remember me by. I don't worry. I got a whole box of them at home or something. Yeah, I, I don't know. I kind of, I don't know. I kind of picture that, uh, you know, Captain, like, also, like how he wouldn't score with Kate Stewart, I kind of picture that he would try to put his charms on Osgood, and yeah, she'd be friendly, but you know, end of the day, she would just be like, you know, he'd probably try to pass her off something, and she'd be like, "Don't you have anything of the doctors?" You know, <laughs> Remember? I don't know. Actually, don't, I don't know. Don't, Captain don't, Jack don't is very perfect. charming. <laughs> he, he gives her, he gives, he sort of gives her a big, nice goodbye smooch, and then she turns into the Zygon, and then he does it. <laughs> but, but. He doesn't care. I was going to say, he oh, absolutely oh. doesn't care. Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> ew. Well, I don't know. I, I, well, actually, no. I, now that I think about it, yeah, I could see Captain Jack kind of shrugging and going, huh, never done that before. <laughs> Well, here's my question to you guys. At one point, it was just incredible that Doctor Who would have two, almost three spinoffs going on while the main series is still happening. We had a Sarah Jane Adventures. We had Torchwood, which both of them are kind of now on a hiatus. I think uh, Sarah Jane's on a permanent hiatus and Torchwood's kind of on a temp. They're doing an audio play now as we speak. They're, they're bringing back an audio form. And K-9, I have yet to watch even that episode. Is Now that we have Unit coming back, do you think there is some Something in Doctor Who that should be respun off into something else. We also talked about Blue Doctor and and you know Tenth Doctor point five and Rose having their own spin off. Is there a series that maybe we should be looking at that should be spun off? I would still fight tooth and nail for at least a Doctor Eight like mini season, like you know a four it's a four episode arc something like that and. It, not even involving anything with the time war. Just let's let's just because he was so good at Night of the Doctor. It was so nice to see him again, and he was much more comfortable in the role. Now that he didn't have to wear the silly wig that he hated, and uh, yeah, I know he's doing the big finish, but I would just let's face it, we all just really love to see him actually running around kicking ass with that confidence that he showed in Night of the Doctor. But I think that adds also added to that comfort level. It's like I've done this for years on an audio, you know, oh, yeah. what's getting back on a you know on a sound what stage. I would, what I would actually, I mean, Patrick, you bring up a good point and what i would kind of like to see you know i would like to see the eighth doctor back maybe something kind of a la what uh marvel's doing with agent carter right now almost sort of like yeah don't set it in the time war but maybe kind of set it right before and yeah. kind of see like what happens before the time war gets really serious uh -huh. see how many people he snogs yeah to... oh my god <laughs> No, no, we're talking Eighth Doctor, not Captain Jack. Hey, he's the first snogger. He's, you know, with uh, Grace Holloway, so hello. Okay, well, all right. Well, yeah, you got a point. That's uh, when it started. But, yeah, <laughs> but, but I would say if you are going to touch the Time War, I would want it to be with the War Doctor. Let's bring John Hurt back, even if it's just for, like, a TV movie. I would love to see more of that. I'd even be okay if you recast it. Uh, if, if he was unavailable, you could do a skinny actor that looks vaguely like a, a middle-aged, uh, you know, it's like like Hurt. And I, I'd, I'd be okay with that. Granted, I'd well, love to see Hurt well, if you could find, Well, if you could find someone who looks like maybe a younger John Hurt and then just put it as being right after Night of the Doctor. Or maybe in the middle or something to that effect. Right. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the possibilities are there, but I, I think... I think Moffat and probably the BBC probably have an unofficial policy of just no one doctor at a time. We'll concentrate on that, and there you go. And my other dream, of course, would be if they haven't struck the sets, oh, I just, you know, uh, again, Adventure in Time and Space, just why didn't they just do 
a lost adventure of Doctor Number One with all the sets and the costumes and the cast and everything else. Why didn't they just do that? See, Patrick, you and I share a dream. I mean, I, I would love – I keep saying after Adventure in Space and Time came out, heck, while it was being made and we had the production photos of David Bradley in costume, I'm like, have him play the first Doctor. You know, bring the first doctor over and have him interact with Matt Smith or Peter Capaldi. I was convinced that the whole thing was kind of a way to disguise an extended presence in Day of the Doctor. I was like, okay, this is a dodge. Yeah, they're filming this biopic movie, but what they're really doing is is that they're filming scenes for the anniversary special, and he's gonna, yeah, but of course that never happened. But yeah, as usual, like headcanon is way cooler than real life, unfortunately. <laughs> Did one of you mention, I, I don't know if I heard, but did one of you mention they should complete the series with that cast? Like film every episode that's gone missing and film it with that cast and just try to do it on TV? That'd be interesting. Interesting. Be interesting. I, 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 would, I would I would, want to see original stories, but I'd be okay with that as well. Yeah, I, I, don't, how, I don't know how that would work. Especially because you have the to animate series well, now with the well, audio. Well, well, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's one thing to use the audio and then animate what's missing, but it's another to actually get a human cast together. Plus, you also have to try to mesh it with what is already there. And I don't know, it, they could it, pull it off. Well, it, it might, it might be a little jarring because given the different levels in production value, it may be a little too jarring. I don't know, but it, but it is, it is an idea to consider. Trish, one of the spinoffs that they were considering were Captain Jack and a River Song spinoff. What do you think about that, and what do you see as a spinoff out there? I love the idea of uh, Captain Jack and River. I think that would be really interesting. As long as they're just not into each other, you know? <laughs> I'd rather see them work together than, you, you know. know but... As much as I dislike River, I would be okay with that pairing, because I, I, I think I think those characters would complement each other very nicely, and yeah, I would definitely see them more like intergalactic tomb raiders and <laughs> getting into more trouble than helping with the big cosmic stuff like the Doctor does. Now that I think about it, I can think of a perfect place to set that in. Rem well, remember that Captain Jack kind of exiled himself into space after Children of Earth, so you've got a nice little window to play with. Have it take place between Children of Earth and when he came back in, uh, around Miracle Day. Now you, could you see Captain Jack flirting with Riversong and Riversong pulling out her ring going, I'm married, darling. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'd be, great, happen. they'd be great wingmen for each other. Could you True. imagine? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you said in the time I just mentioned... That even gives you an added dimension to Captain Jack. I mean, he could be flirting, but the flirtation's kind of like a shield because he's hurting inside. Well, it would be a slow boil. I mean, it would be a slow boil, and you could it could be turned into sci-fi's moonlighting. I mean, they could both have they they go have their adventures. They could have their dalliances with other characters, but there would be this re if they do it right, a very slow boil of a moment where they actually do kind of get together. This would have to be like the this would be the climax, like season three or whatever, where it becomes the point where it's no longer the adventures; it's just all about their relationship. And if the magnets are finally going to like collide, so are we addressing that River Song is rebound? <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell her that. I know, I'm just, I know. No, as far as she's concerned, she's always first on the menu. <laughs> From where Ed is telling me, and as far as as far as Captain Jack is concerned, <laughs> everything else is a buffet, and it's all you can eat. <laughs> this might not be popular, and I would never want to see this as a series, but maybe just as like a a little one off episode. I've always been kind of curious how Martha and Mickey got together, and basically they were both together kicking butt, you know, when yes, they ten were. showed up. So I'd like to know kind of how they were, how they got to that point. Thinking a full episode or a mini sode? It could probably do a full episode. You could do a one shot. I could see a, a, yeah. a fifty minute one shot. Just how they got together and how Mickey kind of found his his manhood and <laughs> you know all throughout the all throughout the time. You know, it's like he felt like kicks ass and he's like, "Who's a dog? Not me." You know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> or the tin or, dog, not me. You know, or something like you know, or something like I might be the tin dog, but this dog bites. <laughs> yeah. Something like that, you know. But but I will say, I mean, yeah, the idea that Mickey and Martha got to got together hasn't been a popular opinion among Whovians. But this may, you know, if you do something really, you know, if you if you get a really good writer to handle this, you could actually maybe change people's minds, or at least kind of 
make an attempt at showing how is this possible. How did Mickey and Martha get together? You know, I don't know why it popped in my head, but the first thing I thought when we were talking about how they got together and you were mentioning it, how about a play within the play, a Rosencrantz and Gilderstern are dead type of deal where we see them in the lives. We see them in scenes with the Doctor or in Martha's case in Torchwood with the scenes and then it takes off to another scene where they're interacting and they're talking about, you know, how she left Torchwood and how he left the Doctor and all that stuff and then it starts to grow from there. So you can see the intertwined happening from the stories that they were in in the series. So maybe something where like you have moments in Doctor Who history, but from their point of view? Exactly. And then from their point of view, you get to see how they get together. I like it. I really do. That's got potential too, especially like you could do something like, for example, we never got to see how did Martha feel about when she was being held captive by the Centaurans because it just went to, oh, the Centaurans are beaten. Hey, would you like to go for one more trip on the TARDIS? I mean, did she ever have a moment where she had to think, oh, I was held captured in a basement with the – you know, some clone sucking my life force or something, you know, it's... And also, she was, at, when she left, the reason why she left was she was engaged to somebody. How did that end? How did that come about? And was Mickey rebound after that? So, there seems to be a lot of potential outside of the Hooniverse series to make this it, to a series, but I know Moffat and nobody's listening to us. <laughs> <And that's... laughs> so, I'm not looking for a commission. Oh, uh, well, I'm sure, and, and I'm sure even, no. even, you know, I'm sure even with our with our logical points that some people are, are listening to this and going, no, no Mickey and Martha. No, no, no. But wait, this makes sense. Hear us out. No. Why don't people like Mickey and Martha getting together? Is it, I don't, you know, is it just because, is it like some just reaction of, oh, I see. They're both people of color. So naturally they get together. Oh, uh, is, it, is that that kind of social justice was... finger wagging or? Um, I, or is it I, jealousy? Because I, I felt like, oh, uh, no, no, Martha's supposed to be with me someday. I thought it was the old Smith and Jones joke. I don't know. I mean, I hear a little bit of social justice warrior with their pairing. And then the other the other thing is just that, yeah, we've never gotten any sort of logical reasoning as to why they're together. All right. So, that makes sense. So it's like, it's like a, little, a little of that, a little of what you said. All right, Trish, what else is in the news there? That is actually all the news we have. Wow. <laughs> I know. Oh, well, not much happened, but well, now that I got to explain why I sounded like a dizzy DJ this morning at the end of the <laughs> introduction of the show, there uh, we have Dominic Lynn, who did some of the some of the most classical scores that we've had in Classic Who, some of the really good stuff that we've had uh, coming from the end of the series as well. He's also done some other stuff. I believe we say what Red Dwarf. He's done some other stuff. Two outside of Doctor Who. His resume is huge. So we're going to interview him in just a few moments when we get back from the commercial break. So, you know, we're going to go to commercial, and then when we come back, we're going to have music man Dominic Glynn. So don't go anywhere. Groovy. See, that's how you DJ. Attention all Whovians. While you're waiting for the new episode of Doctor Who, start your own adventures with a book from Mark Who 42 Books. They carry unique and rare books at affordable prices. Visit Amazon.com slash shops slash Marku42. That's Amazon.com slash shops slash Marku42. Marku42 Books. Set your imagination free into the Hooniverse. Are you looking for a weekly dose of gaming news and retro? And check out Off the Cuff, available Fridays on GeekCast Radio Network from the producers of XRG. New name, same Pixels in the Animation is the GeekCast Radio Network's video game cartoon review show. We are covering every episode of nine different video game cartoons. Join TV's Mr. Neil and myself, TFG and Mike, as we trek through multiple Mario tunes, Zelda, Captain N, Mega Man, Sonic, and we are also driving through Donkey Kong Country. Pixels in the Animation is 100 episodes of video game cartoon goodness, so tune in to help us find the Pixels in the Animation, which you can find every Wednesday on iTunes and www.geekcastradio.com. This is The Brain, and you are listening to the GeekCast Radio Network. Yes! Hello, this is Sylvester McCoy, Doctor Who number 7. I'm on Mark Who 42, Who Universe. What? 
What on earth is that? I have no idea, really. All these numbers. <laughs> All right, everybody. Welcome back. And I am pleased and have the wonderful privilege to introduce Mr. Dominic Glenn. Hey, Dominic. Hey, how you doing? If you're not familiar with Dominic's work, he was actually one of the incident. You wrote the incidental music for the Trial of the Time Lord. Some of the incidental music for Sylvester McCoy's time. Yeah. You forgot the biggest, most important thing. Not only did he do incidental music, but Dominic, you did the arrangement for the main theme for season twenty-three, Trial of a Time Lord. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, absolutely. So when we hear the Doctor Who theme for that season, that's your work. That's right. In some ways, a bit of the lost theme because it didn't run for long, but it's uh, it's become established as that the, the the theme for Colin Baker now. So, uh, which is used now in the in the big Finnish audios and everything. So, I'm happy about that. And so, for uh, those who may still not know about you, who might be part of the new Who world, tell us a little about yourself. Okay. Well, yes, my name's Dominic Glynn. Yes, um, you pretty much got that about right. Really, I started working on Doctor Who back in 1986 after a sort of brief correspondence backwards and forwards with the producer at the time, John Nathan Turner. And I was a young musician playing keyboards in a band and looking to find work in TV. And uh, Doctor Who seemed the appropriate vehicle for me as an electronic music composer. So uh, I was lucky enough to get involved, as I say, starting in 1986. Now, one of the musics that I most appreciate was that you wrote the theme song for Doctor Who for the Trial of the Time Lord season. And I'm going against a grain with a lot of Whovians. That was one of my favorite takes on the theme from Classic Who. I actually uh, enjoyed that theme because that theme was more or less kind of, when it started up there, it was like dun 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 dun, dun but it was more kind of a darker theme. And I kind of enjoyed that. It, it, it seemed like also the first take that it was trying to get out of the theme song itself a little bit and try to do something different. It was, it's one of my favorite themes. Yeah, well, it's interesting because... Um seems to uh, i'm quite happy about it because it seems to uh, uh, induce a reaction in people that either they absolutely detest it <laughs> or they or you know or it's one of their favorite versions so it's kind of there's not much uh, lukewarm in the middle people either love it or hate it so right. i think in a way that's how i'd like it to be i'd like it to have an impact on people and you know if it was just the one that people said yeah it's all right you know i think i'd be quite disappointed really <laughs> no i actually i i thoroughly enjoyed that what did you guys think of it i liked it you know i, I liked it i don't think that there's really any bad version of the theme song. I have to agree with that. <laughs> Even that disco version that was uh, Mankind. I think in the late 70s, you know, that was... Yeah, Mankind. Hey, even that, I mean, hell, it's a Doctor Who theme you can dance to. What's with that? <laughs> yeah, I'm all in favor of that. Yeah. Just saw a disco ball come out of the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. You can dance to any of them. I danced to all of them. I have to say, when uh, John Nathan Turner originally asked me to rearrange the theme, he did ask, basically, for a disco version of the theme. I didn't give him one. <laughs> <laughs> he did ask for one. And my reasoning behind not giving him what he asked for is I thought at the time it was desperately out of date because in 1986, disco was definitely a thing of the past, you know, so there was no way I thought right. I was going to go back in time and uh, give him a John Travolta version, Saturday Night Fever <laughs> version of Doctor Who. So I, I completely ignored him, told him I tried it and it didn't work. And uh, fortunately, he was quite happy with what I did. So uh, The Bee Gees take on the theme. Yeah. <laughs> Now there's an idea. Ah, 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 yeah. Stamla. <laughs> so, Dominic, how did you get the job with Doctor Who? Well, it was, I think some people would say it was like, like a fairy tale come true, really, because I was a keyboard player, you, you know, and I liked messing around with the electronic synthesizers and the like. And I had no musical training, but I just wanted to write music. And um, I was in a band. The band weren't terribly good but I was really devoted to doing it and I thought well, what's my other option if the band isn't really going anywhere you know maybe I could write tv music because I you know I've always loved listening to tv themes and always been interested in the music in films and tv so I just wrote letters off in the way people did in the 1980s I actually wrote or typed letters you know and uh, on a piece of paper and put them in an envelope and put it in the mail and uh, Fortunately, one of the people I wrote to was John Nathan Turner, as I say, was the producer of Doctor Who and had been for quite a few years in the 80s. And, I mean, I, obviously there was a certain amount of luck involved here. I think at the time, 
John was looking to move on from the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, who'd been providing music for a few years on the show. And I think it, my letter landed on his desk at about the same time that he was sort of giving this some thought. And so he was open to listening to the demo tape that I sent him. So I compiled a little cassette tape of weird electronic noises that I thought would sort of fit into the style of the programme. And fortunately for me, he really liked it. And he, I think he said, you know, could I do him another demo I, I sent him the first demo and then i sent him another demo and in fact i also sent him a video that i had done which was a, a corporate training video or a corporate promotional video i'd done for the pest control company and i'd gone in and recorded this synthetic soundtrack to this film about exterminating pigeons or something and, um, and exterminate it, I think it caught, pigeons. yes well exactly it caught his attention i think <laughs> i think the word exterminate may well have been in the video somewhere and so uh i think he thought yeah if he can do it to pigeons he can probably do it to dalek so um <laughs> I sent him a second demo tape, again, which he said he liked, and he was thinking he'd probably offer me work on the show. And then, sadly, just when I felt it was within my grasp, the BBC cancelled the show, um, or so we thought. This is about, it must have been late 84, going into 85. I'm trying to get the dates right. But around about that time, it was announced that the show was going on hold or on a hiatus this was that several month uh hiatus that's right it lasted like i think it was wasn't it over a year it was i think it was 18 months um but initially it was thought that it was actually coming to an end uh and it wasn't you know it was thought that maybe this was an excuse to just cut the show off altogether which is why you know a lot of people will now say looking at the history of doctor who you know all power to john nathan turner for really keeping the show alive you know he fought to keep the show going and so it came back after eight, at least 18 months fortunately in that time john did offer me the work again so although i thought initially i was going to be working on the show in 1985 it was another year uh, before i did start working on the show and so i started work on trial of a time lord which came about initially with a script so um he sent me the script of the first episode and asked me as like a final test for whether or not I could work on the program, whether or not I could write a piece of music that would accompany the opening scene. And I don't know if anybody well, who's familiar with the beginning of a trial of a, the trial of a time Lord, but it has a, a sort of sumptuous model shot um, that at the time sort of caused a few open jaws on the faces of Doctor Who fans, who for the time, very expensive and smart-looking uh, spaceship model shop. You're talking about the Time Lord satellite, right? The thing That's that right, yeah, the space station. In. Yeah, space station. It, it, it was kind of, this was the welcome back to, to viewers for Doctor Who. So it was really, really important, certainly in John's mind, that we got it right, you know, to welcome Doctor Who back onto the screen. So I had to do this demo version of the music, which ended up on the show, but uh, initially I did it as a demo and yeah you know sure enough he, he liked it and that was it you know i got the contract through in the post Having said that, before I'd started work on it, I then had another call from John saying, actually, would I like to have a go at rearranging the theme tune? So that was a kind of afterthought. Um, the initial offer to work on the show was, was to do the incidental music, but the theme tune definitely came afterwards. I love that intro, because it, especially with the, the space shot, when I was a kid watching that, and it was just darker. Yeah. It was just like more sinister and just like Doctor Who's back. Well, I, guess. The thing it's, is it's, I was incredibly lucky to get that as my opening episode, because apart from the fact that it was the most expensive model shot in the history of Doctor Who at the time, it was also, for a musician, it was a great opportunity to just write a, a killer piece of music without any dialogue over it. You know, because normally you're, you're writing incidental music for a, for a drama, 
you're very often you're you're having to be very subtle because you're underneath dialogue and you don't want to crash the words but this opened with a really nice beautiful looking model shot and when i was writing the demo piece you know i was inspired by the script robert holmes wrote the script famously one of doctor who's most popular writers he wrote a lot of episodes in the 70s and 80s for doctor who particularly i think starting in the 60s actually but this was one of his last scripts in fact episode 13 of a trial of a time was his final script for the show um but it was a very very beautifully written description of the space station so it was quite inspiring to write for so i'm really lucky to get that as my opener if you know what i mean you said that you did the music based off the script you got you didn't have any production drawings or anything of what the space station looked like you worked completely off what it described in the script yeah yeah no drawings or anything um it was a very descriptive piece of writing, though, um, and, it, and it talks about being cathedral-like, I think is the expression. I, I wish I had the script in front of me because it's um, – I've got, yeah, I've, I've got it somewhere in the studio here. Uh, but it just, it just describes it brilliantly. And uh, obviously when I wrote the final piece that went on screen, I was working off the video. So, um, you know, it was a bit different, the final piece, but it was very similar to the demo that I did originally. Just the sort of length of it was different because obviously I was imagining how long the, the shot would last and all that kind of thing. Now, I actually had the honor and the privilege to be with you at Hurricane Who this past year. Yeah. And I got from you a nice signed copy of the variations of the theme. So it's not the first time you've actually written the theme song. And yours is called the horror theme, if I'm not mistaken. Well, um, there's a few different ver- versions going around. No, the uh, I did a version in 1990, I think it was, called the terror oh. version. The terror version, right. The terror, the terror version. version, that's right. Now, that was... Um, That came about when uh, DWM, or Doctor Who magazine, as it was called then, wanted to put a free flexi-disc on the front of the magazine with three or four pieces of music uh, that were versions of the Doctor Who music, I think. And that's how it originally started. And then that then became an EP where each of the three composers that were working on the show, which was me, Kef McCulloch, and Mark Ayres, we were all asked to do a new variation on the uh, Doctor Who theme entirely different i hasten to, to add from the from the version that would, would have been on air so they said let your imagination run wild and um come up with something entirely different based on the doctor who theme so yeah my my take on it was to do a kind of horror film version which i i call the terror version and kef mcculloch going in an entirely different direction did a latin jazz version which i think later on ended up being the inspiration for the bill bailey comedy sketch about Doctor Who music which I think you've seen but um and Mark oh, I, got, I, gotta, I gotta hear that one. Oh, it's fantastic YouTube look you look for it on YouTube it is brilliant and then Mark Ayers had, had done something for a Doctor Who convention that went on and, and another version that he put on so we ended up with a full track EP on CD which in fact also bizarrely was released as a square CD and became the world's only the first and I hasten to add last um, square CD so if you've got a copy of the square CD I'm told it's quite valuable because there aren't very many of them around and um, they were banned <laughs> because they don't fit the red book standard for what's supposed to constitute a cd so whoever is responsible the cd police um said i'm sorry you're not allowed to to uh, sell those anymore so there was a rarity the oh, but yeah so that was unfair the, that, yeah very unfair but the and that was the version that i did in 1990 it's only recently that i've returned to the doctor who theme but um that's probably leaping ahead a little bit in time but you know that's something i did initially for the convention in Los Angeles, Gallifrey, in 2013. And uh, I, for 2013, I knew I was doing this convention, and I thought, what can I do that's slightly different if I'm going to attend a convention? Well, unlike actors or directors or writers or whatever who can go and talk, I thought, well, I'm a musician, I can go and play music. So I had this hit upon the idea of doing a new, brand new version of the Doctor Who theme, which would kind of be how I would have done it perhaps now. And so I put together a mix uh, which I performed live at the Gallifrey Convention. And that kind of combined two elements of my career, which after I'd finished working on Doctor Who in, in uh, about 1990, I started working, as, I had two arms of my career at that point. One was writing music for TV, which I carried on doing and, and still do. But I also did a lot of dance music, underground electronica, a left field kind of techno and house music. And the opportunity to combine two parts of my career in one 
sort of reared its ugly head when I thought oh, I can do the Doctor Who theme and I can now do what I refused John Nathan Turner when I was asked to do his version in 1986 I can actually do a dance version of the Doctor Who theme so oh. pretty much that's what I did with <laughs> Gallifrey remixes and that started as I say with one remix which went down really well in Gallifrey and everybody kept saying oh where can we buy it and I said well you can't buy it I've only just done it today as a, a one off but you know I've got so many requests I thought okay right well how do I respond to this I'll I'll do three more mixes and make a four-track mini album. So that's what I did. I did four new remixes of the Doctor Who theme, and I released them, um, put them out uh, via iTunes and Amazon, and uh, you know, on, on digital download uh, release. And that came out last year, and um, c- continues to do very well. So anybody who's interested, check it out on iTunes or Amazon. Excellent. Excellent. Now, one, one, my favorite tune, and one of my favorite texts is not only the the Trial of the Time Lord version is the Terror version as well. And when I was a kid growing up, listening to that, this is what's weird about me because I write stories and plays and stuff like that. I always saw the intro of that being I don't know where it came from originated that the the Time Lords had put the Doctor in a coffin. It was his final voyage. They launch him into space, and that's where all that music came from. And then the coffin turns around when you hear the orchestra go, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you see a Dalek ship coming in and taking the Doctor away, and they're going to use him as a weapon. As a child. I don't know why it came up, but that's <laughs> that's what I thought every time I hear that song. And then the orchestra goes, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> And I well, thought, well I'll tell you cool. what, um, you're not the, the only person to sort of had this flight of imagination while they were listening to it. A few people have told me they listened to it, including, I think, pretty sure Rob Shearman told me he listened to it pretty regularly while he was writing Dalit. So uh, <laughs> it's been a soundtrack to a few writers. Ben Aronovich, when he was working on Doctor Who, used to listen to my soundtracks while he was writing the Dalit. Actually, there's a connection, Dalek's connection here, obviously. Um, <laughs> ben Aronovich used to listen to my scores while he was writing uh, Remembrance of the Daleks. Um, so, yeah, ho- I'm ho- hopefully when I'm writing, I'm always thinking visually. So, obviously, it's working for some people. And apparently this song envisions Daleks in our brains, so... Um... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now well, I see Daleks invade... Ex- Nobody ever asked me to do a Dalek story. I would have loved <laughs> a Dalek story, you know. Um, and now I see Daleks in, uh, exterminating pigeons everywhere now. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. But when the, the Terra version, um, again, you know, people seem to... Have, responded nicely to the terror version so uh, when i uh, did um long island who this year and also then chicago i have expanded what initially started off as a one piece of music uh, live mix which is the gallifrey remix i've now started to perform other things other pieces of music from doctor who so i do a, a full live set now of music including the terror version so i formed a live version of the terror mix um at Long Island Who and and at Chicago this year. So it's expanding. Hopefully at some point I'll put that out as a new version as well. So, you know, keep your ears and eyes peeled.
Doctor Who is not only in, in your resume. You have others, and I've got to say one of my second favorite sci-fis, Red Dwarf. Ah, yeah. Yeah, well, the, I, I've got a lot of shows in my resume that I didn't realize I had worked on, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, really? Um, <laughs> My main job these days, actually, is writing music for TV, but not directly, usually, for a TV show. What I do is I write for the publishers, um, people like Universal, who release library music, which is a bit like a photo library. I'm sure people are familiar with photo libraries if they're not with music libraries. Um, if, if a newspaper or magazine needs a photo of something, they chances are they'll take a photographer and get him to go and take the photo or they will take a photo that's already been taken and use that and then they'll pay whoever took the photograph the same thing happens with music if a tv show needs music they either use a composer or they use a piece of music that's been pre-written and i'm one of the composers that pre-writes this music um called library music or production music as it's called nowadays the result being that i write music in hundreds of different styles whatever i'm commissioned to write and uh, it ends up in all sorts of places and i don't always know about it until maybe a year later when i see my royalty statement or something and it says oh, right. or something on those lines in fact red dwarf i did know about because i i was a regular viewer so uh if ever i was watching red dwarf and some of my music came on i was very much aware of it you know but there are lots of shows which i completely missed and then spotted later on that i've had a, quite a lot of music in it so you know actually that brings up something that uh, that i'd want to ask because i was looking at your resume and i noticed that your name comes up for an episode of the simpsons cartoon yeah, uh, would yeah. this would this be one of these shows that uh, what you did was you just did some uh, some stock music and they ended up using it, or did yeah. they actually come to you? No, they they they, uh, they in an episode they needed some music that sounded a bit like the Doors because basically Homer has an antacid trip, so he he opens, <laughs> the, door, opens the door of his fridge and there's nothing in there except some bicarbonate of soda. Oh, the the baking soda. <laughs> Baking soda, oh, yeah. My. So um, he takes the, ba the baking soda and then drifts off into this psychedelic sort of dream. And in the background, they needed something that sounded a bit like The Doors or something a bit psychedelic in 60s. And although they have a composer who writes for The Sim Simpsons, obviously they don't always have the opportunity to do everything with the orchestra and, you know, have it all... Pre in this particular case, they obviously quickly needed something that sounded right. And, yeah, I hadn't to have done a piece of music that was a piece of psychedelic... 60s sounding a bit like the doors and they so they use that you know so that's how it ends up in all sorts of shows you know i i, I mean literally thousands of shows because it goes all around the world so i've got music coming out of shows in south korea and malaysia and australia and south america and you know wherever it is it's a very strange profession <laughs> i also noticed you did music for a film called bad day and yeah. I did see that you even got to act in it. Uh, you played a policeman. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how did that come about? How did you? Uh, well, how did you go from just doing the music to somebody saying, "Here, put this uniform on"? Okay. Well, that happened because um, my daughter was in the film. Uh, now she was a child actress at the time. She auditioned for this film, and the director. Well, first of all, no, she auditioned for a short film. Um, and got on very well with the director, and I went with her to accompany her to the filming of the short film, got on very well with the director, who, lo and behold, loved Doctor Who. <laughs> so um, so we kind of kept in touch, and a couple of years later, he did this feature film. Again, my daughter was still quite young, um, so I went to accompany her, me and my wife went to accompany her on the filming that day, and just out of the blue, the director said, right, we need some policemen. Who wants to be a policeman? Right, Dom, <laughs> you're going to be a policeman. And, you know, I was marched off, fitted with a police uniform, and um, had to go and... Uh, on the performance of my career, I think, um, dressed as a policeman and pretending to talk in the background. I was an extra, basically. I don't know whether I get classified as an extra because I had to sort of pretend to be talking. You don't actually hear me speak, but... Um, I've done extra work, and if you're pretending to speak, I think, yeah, they can't use an extra. No, that's right. Well, anyway, I've got a credit on the film, so uh, look out for it. Bad day, everybody. It's, uh, yeah, it's, I'm, I've got an IMDb credit as an actor, so that's something. <laughs> <laughs> My one and only role. <laughs> I'm so far, so far. A cop. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, it could it could have been worse. I've donned the policeman's uniform for a couple of roles as an extra, and there was one day I had to spend it carrying a coffin. Oh, really? Yeah, and actually, like midway through it, the prop guys were like, "You guys look like you're having it way too easy," so they put more weight on there. Yeah, that's often a problem, actually, in uh, films. We notice it. We're always spotting this. People are supposed to be going on holiday or something. They pick up their suitcase, and it's clearly got nothing in it. <laughs> You know, instead of everybody's suitcase, you know, you struggle to pick the thing up. Yeah. Know. Now, what is the piece or the work that you're most proud of doing? Oh, blimey, there's a question. Um, that's a very good question. In a way, <laughs> in a way, well, two things. We, we try to find those. We try to find good yeah, questions. Thanks every now and then. Guys, yeah, you're, you're, you're probably You're probably asking him to choose between his children. You know? <laughs> yes, that's right. And, okay, of, co- and it, of course, this is going out like all over the world. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no escape, is there? Well, I'm going to answer that uh, by splitting it in two ways, basically. I'm going to answer the, it in the Doctor Who area to start with uh, and say that um, as far as Doctor Who's concerned, I'm going to I'm actually going to choose the Gallifrey remixes because huh. it's recent and it's you know technically much more how I would like my music to sound when i listen back to what i did in 1987 or whatever obviously i sort of part of me cringes and goes oh god that sounds awful because i you know i know that you know i've progressed and technology's progressed and um you know we've all moved on kind of thing but uh, the gallifrey remixes are, are recent but they still embody the spirit of doctor who and i'm happy with how they they ended up so in the doctor who world i'm going to talk about the gallifrey remixes outside of doctor who i probably like to say the feature film that i've just done last year which was a dangerous game which is a documentary feature about donald trump and similar billionaire property developers who've uh, built luxury golf resorts um very often at the expense of the local environment and you know sort of having little regard for local residents and all that kind of thing so the documentary is quite a hard-hitting expose of, of activities like that really but i wrote the score for that there's a lot of music in it um, and i'm very pleased with how the films turned out so I suppose, yeah, those are probably the two things I'm most proud of in my career so far. Going back to Gallifrey One for a second, I, I've always wanted to go to that convention, and how was it? Oh, it's fantastic, yeah. I mean, it's the <clears throat> the biggest convention I've ever been to. I've never been to any of the sort of mega generic sci-fi conventions like San Diego or anything like that. So I've only been to Doctor Who conventions, and that you know, it's big, but not too big. It's still very friendly. Um, there's a lot of interaction uh, with uh, fans and, and um, guests. Everybody's very respectful. It's just a really lovely convention. So, uh, you know, and plus, of course, for, for a Brit like me to be able to, <laughs> to get away in February to somewhere where the sun comes out, it's just a, it's a joy, you know. So I loved it. it. It was great. Yeah, that's my plan to get to that convention one day. I don't think you'd be disappointed. Well, where are you, Trish? Whereabouts are you? Uh, Reno, Nevada. So. Ah, okay. Yeah. Directly yeah. north. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you've got no excuse then. Yes. <laughs> you've got no excuse. <laughs> well, the tickets sell out in March the previous year. Yeah they, yeah, they sell out within a week or so. So maybe this year I will try to buy for next year. <laughs> you better get in quick. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, fingers crossed. I might be there in sixteen, actually. So uh, that would be good. Oh, hey. Yes. Yeah. There we go. Now, Dominic, do you have any future projects that you're working on right now? Well, at the moment, I'm working on uh, another load of library music, which, um, as I say, keeps coming, which is fortunate for me. At the moment, I'm doing some music kind of designed for CGI animation movies. So it's it's kind of playful, kind of uh, DreamWorks, Pixar type music. So uh, that's the project I'm working on at the moment. I've also got a, something which I can't talk about, actually. There's a radio series, which, uh, fingers crossed. You can talk about it here. You're amongst friends. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I, I think what he means, Christian, is that if he talks about it, some guys will come to his house and break oh, through. Okay. One of yeah. those. Yeah, that's right. I'm afraid. People they so. threw threw cop uniforms on at the last yeah. minute and just ran through. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, quite an exciting uh, project coming up. I think um, sci-fi related, actually. But um, beyond that, I'll say no more. Okay, well, <laughs> when the gag comes off, please let us know. We you I know will. we will we will promote it like crazy fantastic you're very kind thank you i think i actually have an idea we should all get together we should do our own script make our own movie and i say right now we hire dominic he can act in the film in fact Mm. maybe we'll even create a we'll create a sequence at a club and he can play the dj what do you guys think i'm a uh, dj cop (laughs) 
DJ, DJ Cobb. Or DJ Cobb. <laughs> copyright 2015. Oh, there, right? there, there we go. Or you know what? Or, or, or even better, even better, we call him DJ Terror Doctor. Oh, I like it. I like Come it. On. I like there there you go. I think, you know what? That's, there we go. We got scene one right now. Open in on a club. DJ Terror Doctor working the table. <laughs> Boom. There we go. First line of the script right there. While solving crimes uh, simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Whoa. Actually. <laughs> That that's a good one. That's a good. Yeah. Oh God, where's my pen? I got. And when did you start getting paid for the radio show? Because I don't have a budget for anything like this. <laughs> I could probably put Dominic with stick figures and play some music in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know, Christian. We got we got a good idea going on here. I think we get some backing. I think we get some uh, some studio backing here. Come yeah, on. Well, <laughs> if we got if you can get the backing, I'm I'm on the project. I I will be wholeheartedly there. I have no problem. Love it's to getting, work with good. Dominic. It's getting good. Now, Dominic, where could people find you like a, a web presence i know uh, i think dominic dash glenn yeah dominic, yeah, dominic uh, or hyphen glenn it's the it's hyphen the line glenn. in the middle as opposed to the underline mark so yeah dominic hyphen glenn.com and i'm on, on facebook so if you want to seek me out on facebook and add me please do also obviously the um the music we've been talking about is available on itunes and amazon so if you look me up on there you'll find a soundtrack to bad day actually that we were talking about as well as the gallifrey remixes so yeah yeah check that out that's probably the best way of uh, finding what i've done so far there's a there's a few samples of bits and pieces on the website as well so i was going to use itunes to complete my collection of donald fagan music but you know what i may have to put that in the back burner now yeah 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 that'll wait that'll wait <laughs> yeah, sorry you know, if, if, if you're listening donald fagan i'm really sorry uh, love your work with steely dan love the song igy but you know come on this guy did the gallifrey remixes uh, that's okay he, it's another guess we're not going to have to anytime soon he sold, a, he sold a lot of copies already so there you go well just in case for our fans out there uh when this episode premieres check out uh, marku 42 facebook site we will have dominic's website up there for you just go up there and click as soon as the uh, episode premieres for everyone to download wow it's great to talk to you guys and it was great. Thank you. It's an honor and a privilege, Dominic. Thank you so much for being on Mark Who 42's Hooniverse. Yeah, here we are. We've had Doctor Who music guy Dominic Glynn. Yeah, told us about all the themes that he rearranged. That was, that was just totally nice. And we're here with comedy man Patrick Hawkins, the geek of comedy. Yeah, he's been making us. That's like me. That. Making That's us... me. He's talking about me on the radio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah. He, said, he said to be my name on the radio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're just we're just talking all sorts of all sorts of Doctor Who. We just we're just getting together on this lovely evening and we're talking Doctor Who. Just just you and me, just real nice, real nice. Talk talking about the Doctor in his little blue box. I need a shower right now. I like to make a dedication <laughs> request. I want Serpent Bird. Yeah, all right, all right, all right, Groovy Man. Yeah, we're gonna be playing that now. Yeah, just just for you. You got anybody you want to shout out to? I, I like to shout it out to uh, 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 the, the guy who played uh, the one character who got killed on that one episode. He did a great job. Okay, well, we'll dedicate this to him. You, you gave up your life in that one episode, and you know we we appreciate that. You know, no, no, not that I, episode. I, I, the I, other episode. Oh, the other episode. Oh, yeah, that was that was a good one too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you got you got good taste, Patty Man. Yeah. Ah, well, well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And if you haven't ch- switched channels or turned off the radio or just shut off your <laughs> podcast for uh, welcome back to Marku Forty Two's Universe. I hope you enjoyed our interview with Dominic Glenn. That that was fun though. That was really fun. I do hope he gets to come back. He really does need to come back. And if you want to learn more about Dominic Glenn, he's actually got his own site, his own site on Facebook, but he has his own, his own website, uh, Dominic Glenn, just in case, it's D-O-M-I-N-I-C dash G-L-Y-N-N dot com. You get to learn everything about Dominic, his history, where he's been, where he's going to be, and everything about Doctor Who and all the stuff that he's in there. Plus, he's got some albums coming out there. One of my favorite that we mentioned was the horror version of the Doctor Who thing. He's putting out a new version. So if you want to listen to that, you can download that. You can check it out on his site. So please go ahead and visit that site. Not bad promoing, Christian. Uh, (laughs) Didn't do it in a DJ voice, but still really good. Uh, I'm, I'm done with the DJ voice. <laughs> I think everybody else is. 
but definitely if you want to check out his stuff, if you want to purchase his stuff, check out his site. You can also, when the episode premieres on Krypton Radio, we will have his website out on Marku 42 and the Legend Tra- Traveling Tardis, so you can check it out there when the episode premieres. Patrick, do you have any upcoming shows or? Uh, I, I have. Well, I have, I have an interesting thing. Um, I uh, I have a, a, a film premiere to attend to tonight. A small little film, independent film. Actually, it's going to get a uh, national release, I believe, uh, called uh, Robo Dog, which my audio production studio, Tai Fi Studios, uh, did the soundtrack uh, for. So I'm I'm really kind of interested in that. I'm a minority partner in it. Uh, my best friend uh, Dan Fontana is head engineer, and he's been working on that for a couple that business for a couple of years now. But uh, it's kind of interesting. I'm gonna walk the red carpet tonight. And um, awesome. Oh, when is I'm it? Very, uh, when is the uh, national release? I'm not sure yet. It just it was just it was out of left field. I knew he was working on it, and then he just he he, he texted me last week. Said, "Hey, there's an Orlando red carpet premiere. Uh, you want to go?" I was like, uh, <laughs> "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> oh geez, drag me out of the Any, house! I was, like, I was like, "Are you kidding?" Any excuse to wear to wear nice clothes and wear my monocle, I'm there. I'm very excited about that. As usual, I'm talking to scores of uh, of event of promoters and whatnot, and of course, nothing's been finalized yet, so I don't want to jinx it. But um, yeah, we're, we're we're plugging away. It's still early in convention season, so. Um, and so, so many organizers haven't even gotten to their schedules yet. But uh, hey, you know, it's like, like things are afoot. I will say that much. Well, hey, and let's not forget that the Hooniverse is also going to be doing the convention rounds. Christian, where are you and Mark going to be in Florida? Actually, it's going to be me, Mark, and Patrick. We are going to be at Megacon, Megacon Convention oh, yeah. Center at the Orange County Convention Center, April 10th through the 12th. Keep an eye out on their Facebook site or their website for megaconconventions.com. They should have announcements. Uh, of course, the biggest announcement being that Karen Gillan will be there, so she's going to make a return here in, in the States. Uh, but definitely, you'll want to come and see out the Geeks of Comedy with Patrick and Marku 42's Hooniverse with me, Patrick, and Mark. And if you want to come on out, we're going to be there for all three days. So if you decide you only want to be there for one day, we're going to be there all three. So you have a chance to come out and see us there. I'll, I'll throw this out. If you're only going to be there one day, uh, you probably want to go Friday or Sunday. Saturday is going to be bug nuts. And if you do come on Saturday, get a parking spot by 6 a.m. And that's not a joke. I'm <laughs> oh, absolutely... You want to be there early. Yeah. Oh, serious. Lord. I am dead serious. Get a parking spot by no later than at least 7 a.m. And wow. that is my the hand, hand on the Bible truth. As for this side of the country. Patricia and I are going to be at RageCon in June. Isn't that right, Trish? Yep. yep. Oh, so far, nice. We've already got brainstorming on some panels. Plural. And actually, our uh, chapter of the Weekend TARDIS, Weekend TARDIS Reno, we are having our first meeting on March 7th. So, yay! Finally getting that off the ground. Trish and I are already brainstorming on what we're going to be doing. But we definitely got some fun stuff, and I think maybe even some stuff involving prizes. And always catch us here on Krypton Radio, or if you miss us, you can catch us at www.markwho42.net. You can download the episodes after the premiere, or on iTunes free at any time, any place, anywhere. Or, of course, do both. Do both. Or do both. Listen, listen to, and then listen on, Krypton, listen on Krypton Radio go, Oh my god, that episode where Patrick Hawkins came back and they did all the DJ stuff. That was so cool. I want to keep a copy for myself. I don't, I don't sound like that. <laughs> that, that, wasn't, that wasn't you, Patrick. Yeah, you I can listen. And, and, and at some points, we actually may have Easter eggs on our downloadable episodes down there. Always keep tuned to us for the latest Doctor Who news, reviews, and interviews every week. And anybody have any last words? It's not so much Easter eggs, Christian as it is, you know, you see the movie in theaters and then out comes the Blu-ray and the DVD with, you know, the special extended unrated edition. It's more like after Valentine's, so it'd be the 50% off candy and chocolates there. Oh, oh you're so <laughs> short. Yeah. Come on, come on. So they get the goodies thereof at, at reduced cost. Get their money's worth. Oh, see, come on. No, no. See, uh, oh, man, it's too, too, too bad you lost your DJism because you got to be like, hey, don't forget, you know, you have this special copy with stuff that you did not hear on the Krypton Radio version. Yeah, that's right. You get more of Mark U42 when you download it off iTunes. Hell, listen to both. Because, hey, you go to the movies, this is buying the DVD with extra stuff because we give it to you, our fans. Because, you know, because, you know, we love you. We love you. We love the fans. Chris, any uh, final words at this point? <laughs> oh, are we still on? No. Oh, yeah, we're still on. <laughs> <laughs> 
don't know if anybody's listening, but we're still on. <laughs> no, just have a great week. We'll talk. We'll see you guys next time. You, you know Patrick what? Real, real quick, let me throw, throw something on here. We've been talking about all this DJ stuff. I think we might be a little remiss not acknowledging the passing of, of Gary Owens. Oh. And um, granted, didn't have anything to do with Doctor Whoism, but he certainly had a lot to do with geekdom, being the original voice of Space, Space Ghost Space and Ghost. so many other cartoon characters that uh, I, I think all generations out there grew up on. Grew up yeah, in the man. 70s, other characters, and even the 90s, Powder Toast Man. And, um, hey, you know, hey, he had Commander a heck of a Farrell. run. But you, you can't forget Farrell. You can't forget Farrell from SWAT Cats. Uh, <laughs> absolutely not. Forget, not. Uh, you cannot forget. To my, to, this, to my dying day, I will always, Gary Owens, I will always love his renditions of, bring me Chopper back up. <laughs> Mr. Owens, rest in peace, man. I'll bring you your Chopper back up. And, of course, the confusion that everybody thought that George Lowe had passed away. And they had, like, no, no, no. There was another guy before him. You know, he was he was the first Space Ghost. George Lowe was the second regeneration of Space Ghost. So there. There's our Doctor Who tether. There you go. All right, everybody. Have a great <laughs> week. Thanks for listening. Thanks again to uh, all you guys for letting me sit on with you, with you. It was a magnificent pleasure. You can find me at Come Get Some. Uh, that's the sum spelled with the uh, Sigma symbol. Or at the Geeks Comedy. Excellent, guys. Have a great time. We'll see you next week. Enjoy. And remember. There's nothing wrong with it. Just keep it simple. Have a great one, folks. Exactly. We'll exactly. Next keep it simple. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Love for a time and space. Yeah. Yeah, we'll catch you later. Mark Who 42's Hooniverse has been written and presented by Patricia Helm, Eduardo M. Fryer, Patrick Hawkins, and Christian Basil. This show was edited, produced, and directed by Mark Baumgarten. Please visit markroom42.net and register to join and be a part of the Hooniverse Army. We can be contacted by email at mark at markroom42.net with the subject line, question mark. If you have worked on Doctor Who or are working on a project relating to Doctor Who and want to be on our radio show, please email our media relations director, Christian Basil, at marku42media at yahoo.com. Doctor Who and its properties are owned by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. This show is owned and copyrighted by Mark Baumgarten 2015. You're listening to Krypton Radio.